Hello, dear friends of Books and Voices of Revelation. Below, we have the narration of the following audiobook. 45 Years of Hope by David Yonggi-cho Cell Groups and Lay Leadership Part 1 Cell Groups The Church is a community of love where the holy people of God redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ gather. This community is a living body and organism with Jesus Christ as its head. Therefore, we can define the Church as a spiritual garden that produces life through God's love and communion with the Holy Spirit. If we consider cells as the smallest unit of a body, the Church also needs a minimal organization like cells. Therefore, small groups are needed in the Church that proclaim the life of Jesus Christ, be the light and salt of the earth, and have fellowship with the saints. And these small groups, we call them, home cell group. Why are cell groups important? Within a church there are small groups that are distinguished by their function and talents. However, the cell system is the most basic of all those small groups, and cell groups are the infrastructure of the church that builds and strengthens the community of the church. As much as the leaves of small groups seem energetic, if the root of the cell system is weak, the tree of the church community cannot bear good fruit. In this sense, the cellular system is the root that fortifies the church tree and a basic necessity for bearing fruit. At the global level, we notice that the fastest growing churches are the churches that have implemented the cell system. The cellular system is not something selective, but a fundamental organization for achieving eagle growth. Even if another pastor comes to occupy the position of general pastor in a church, the church can remain strong because of the infrastructure of the cell system, since cell groups are small churches in themselves. Cell groups play a central role in establishing God's kingdom here on earth and proclaiming God's heart. Spiritual Vitamin Factory of Love Communion among the saints is the spiritual vitamin so that cell groups can receive the necessary nourishment. But as the church grows, it becomes more difficult to circulate the spiritual vitamin of love. The early church in Jerusalem had a conflict between Greek-speaking and Hebrew-speaking members. The cause of the murmuring was the lack of daily distribution attention to Greek-speaking widows. Acts 6 verses 1 to 6. Likewise, the same dilemmas are found today in fast-growing churches. We must supply love through the cellular system, for love is what God considers most important. Just as greater nourishment is required as the body develops, so too does the church need the depth, altitude, and breadth of communion among the saints to increase as it grows. Therefore, members need an organization where they can give and receive love, and the cellular system is the best answer to this issue. In case there is not a genuine communion of love among the saints, they can never bear fruit, it would be like disrespecting one's neighbor and forming parties of one's own interests. Cell groups should be like places where love is made and love is given, in a familiar atmosphere of love. God is love. A cell group that fails to deliver love to its members can affect the entire church community. In this sense, the loving fellowship of cell groups is the driving force for establishing a strong church. Small churches with ministerial authority. Every human being has a limitation, and the capacity of a pastor cannot be an exception. A pastor alone cannot perform all the ministerial tasks such as preaching, evangelizing, counseling, visiting homes, etc., but he needs collaborators to whom he can entrust the work. Therefore, the cellular system is the best strategy for delegating the work. To achieve a growing church, the pastor must regard lay leaders as his co-workers and colleagues, and delegate his ministerial authority. Moses, who had led the Israelite people from captivity in Egypt, was not able to judge all the appeals that were presented to them. Moses felt a limitation in his leadership as the road to the promised land lengthened. And what Moses did was delegate his ministerial authority to a group of leaders who had the same fear of God and the same vision to govern the people of Israel. At the suggestion of his father-in-law, Jethro, Moses appointed leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifty, and tens, and delegated their authority. In this way he was able to lead the people of Israel, who by the way numbered millions, reasonably and effectively. Exodus 18 verses 13 and 27. Just as the cell system is like the districts of heads of ten, and the smallest unit of the human body, the cell groups are like a small church within a large community. The church will grow healthily into a large community when cell groups adopt and follow the vision and ministry philosophy of the senior pastor. A stage to serve and be served. The believer is in a relationship of dependency because he is a member of the body of Christ, that is, the church. Just as the hand helps the foot, the ear helps the mouth, and the mouth helps the stomach, members must help each other to keep the church moving. Not only should the pastor serve his members, but the members should also serve one another and form a community of love, each esteeming the others as superior to themselves. 
To accomplish this purpose, the Holy Spirit gives the gifts according to the measure of each member. 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 and 31, to some is given the gift to heal the sick, to others the gift to give goods, to others the gift to serve, to others the gift to teach, to others the gift to proclaim the gospel. And all these gifts are given for the benefit of their brethren. In this sense, the gift is always accompanied by vocation. The Bible exhorts us by saying, be acquainted with one another without grumbling, each one according to the gift he has received, minister to one another, as good stewards of God's manifold grace, 1 Peter 4 verses 9 to 10, emphasis mine. According to this perspective, the system provides the perfect setting for the saints to practice love and serve one another. How to organize the cellular system? To organize involves forming the outline and the outer figure. Likewise, the cellular system must also begin by planting the seed, that is, man under the direction of the Holy Spirit. First of all, we must pray for God to send souls. We have to get used to praying at the beginning and end of a task. Jesus prayed all night before choosing his twelve disciples. The heart of Jesus was nothing less than the heart of God. Jesus chose as his disciples people who worked at sea, in the market, etc. Likewise, a ministry must be born through prayer, according to God's plan. In the formation of a cell group it is the same, first you must pray and, together with the people God has sent you, you must start the cell group. From two to twelve people. Jesus began by choosing two or three people as disciples, and then limited the group to twelve men. The Bible symbolizes the number twelve as the largest number in an organization. Therefore, it is preferable to multiply the cell group when it exceeds the limit of twelve members. It is not recommended that a leader be in charge of more than a dozen people in his or her cell group. In the case of our church, we used to allow cell groups to be up to fifteen families. However, it is advisable to divide the cell group in two when it exceeds the limit of 12 people, which in turn will also have to multiply when it exceeds that limit. Even if the newborn cell group is made up of one or two people, it should aim to reach 12 people and work to make that small church grow and multiply. To God one soul is worth more than the whole world, Matthew 16 verse 26, therefore, we should not aim to just fill a number, but to go out in search of a soul, motivated by love and the principle of visualization, adding one by one the number of converts, and thus form the cell group of 12 people. Consider the geographical condition and the place of activity. A basic and fundamental element of the cell system is to consider the geographical condition before forming the cell groups. One of the advantages of geographical status is the time and strength of mobility. A cell group formed on the basis of personal relationships and other elements such as close friendships has a high chance of failure. This is because people waste a lot of time on the journey, and in the end they lose the motivation to continue being part of that cell group. That is why we must never allow cell groups to be formed on the basis of personal relationships, but on the basis of geographical proximity. A healthy and beautiful cell group is formed according to this criterion. Cell groups can also form in the activity of the members of a group. For example, it is highly effective to form a group if there are several siblings working in the same company. We must keep in mind that the advantage here is also time. There are many instances where a leader has opened a cell group in their workplace, and it has borne a lot of fruit. What are the functions of cell groups? Just as a man becomes ill or suffers from cardiac arrest when the basic organs of his body function properly, so the church also ceases to grow if it is not properly functioned. Nutrition is not supplied. The basic organs that make up the body of the church must function normally. The cellular system is the basic organ of the body of Christ, and it has four functions, cell, network, nerves, and blood vessels. The cellular system multiplies and grows based on these four functions. Cell. Every organism is made up of cells and grows through their multiplication. Likewise, cell groups must multiply in order for the church to grow. As Paul pointed out, the church is a living organism where the head is Jesus Christ, and all the members of the body act through the work of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 2 verse 19, and the cellular system fulfills the function of biological cells. Just as the body suffers from disease if biological cells fail to do their job, the church will suffer great harm if the cellular system fails to do its job. That is why the church must provide the cellular system with the necessary nourishment and nourishment, so that through multiplication it can grow. Just as the body becomes sick when the cells allow a virus to enter, for example, the church stops growing and stagnates when it allows the cell groups to be invaded by murmuring, complaining, and hatred. Very special care is therefore required in terms of cell groups for the church to grow. Net. God wants us to be fishers of men.
a fisherman's mission is not just to fish, but to fish a lot. Jesus Christ wants us to fish abundantly. When Peter cast the net upon meeting the risen Jesus, he caught so much that the net was about to break. The number of fish he had caught was 153. The network is nothing less than the cell group. We can catch many souls as we manage to cast as many nets as possible. Just as we need tighter mesh nets to catch more fish, cell groups need to be organized systematically and strategically. Without cellular networks, new converts are likely to move on. Cell groups are the foundation for advancement, where newcomers receive needed care and proclaim the good news to the whole world, thus they fulfill the R1 of the salt and light of the world. Nerves It is impossible for a pastor alone to supply all the individual needs of each person, and to train them. I believe that the role of the shepherd is limited to feeding his sheep, but he is not personally responsible for training them individually. The pastor can, through the cell system, learn about the diverse needs of his members and meet them through cell group leaders. These leaders are collaborators of the pastor, who dedicates his time and effort to know what the needs of the people are, and to transmit the joy and pain together with the members of the group. The leader is also the nerve that passes on the information of the pastor's vision of the church. Cell groups are also a channel where the dangers of the current of this world and false doctrines are reported and warned. The church should see to it that cell groups are able to fulfill the function of the central nervous system. Just as one nerve can paralyze the entire body, cell groups are the core of the movement of the entire church community and the channel of transmission. Blood vessels. Just as blood vessels provide nourishment and vitality to the body through blood, the church provides God's word and strengthens members' faith through general worship and cell groups. The variety of problems that people suffer from is immense. The message of Sunday services does not penetrate and solve a person's most intimate problems, additional nutrition is needed to meet the more minute needs of the members, through the cell groups. The group leader has the authority to visit homes and determine what a family's needs are, and provide the necessary direction. The cell group leader is the blood vessel that brings life through prayer, visitation, word, and service. The pastor is like a doctor, while a cell group leader is like a nurse who knows each person's situation. The church can grow without only the cellular system being able to fulfill the function of the blood vessels. Three prerequisites for cell group growth. Three key requirements are needed for a cell group to grow, man, message, and method. First, we must win men, especially cell group leaders who lead a theocentric life, love God, and have a passion for lost souls. God does not work before he has man, and he never works great before he finds someone after his own heart. This is why we train people. Second, you need a message that has two spices, conviction and transformative power. If the message is not firm and concrete, no one will be transformed. The message must be like the sound of a trumpet, for that was the beginning of a war in ancient times. Third, we must know the method, how to lead the cell meeting, how to preach the word, how to care for people. Man. A person who thinks about failure will never achieve success. The worst enemy of success is defeatism. I'll never be able to become a cell group leader, I can't grow my cell group, things don't go right no matter how hard I try. Such defeatists cannot be partakers in God's work, for God will use them only when they renounce that kind of negativism. The Holy Spirit manifests himself in our lives through thought and language. Psalm 23 verses 1 and 3 says, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. In places of delicate pasture he will make me rest, he will shepherd me by still waters. It will comfort my soul, he will lead me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. One of the ways to undo defeatist language is through a language of faith. I can do anything God tells me to do. And I shall not want. We must confess as, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And to feed our minds with words of faith such as, I shall not want. I can do God's work, if he has entrusted this to me, I know that he will fill me with his power, his grace, and his glory. I shall not want. Man's worst enemy is the frustration and feeling of inferiority he keeps in his own heart. David had a simple formula, Jehovah, more, shepherd, equal, I shall not want. God has not called us and committed his work to us because we are worthy, but it is he himself who does all the work. Therefore, we must live in the power of God who created the heavens and the earth, plus all that is in it, and has saved us. We must fill our minds with Jehovah our God, our greatest resource. But if we continue to keep our eyes on circumstances, on finances, on education, on social position, we will never be able to escape from the shadow of defeatism. God calls the one who keeps conviction and confesses words of victory. Message 
one of the works of the Holy Spirit is to train a person's inner man. The Holy Spirit quickens us through word and prayer. The inner man needs to be renewed, and the Christian life also needs to be constantly enlivened through Sunday meetings, Wednesday meetings, and cell groups. Our inner man is enlivened by the Word and the Holy Spirit, through worship. God guides us in the way of righteousness for His name's sake. God's heart is to be with us, to make us rest in places of delicate pasture, and to shepherd us by the waters of rest. This is the way in which our relationship with God is formed. Every person who believes in Jesus Christ should look to God as his or her greatest resource. God uses men, companies, country, circumstances, to bless us. What we are essentially contemplating is dependence on God. The message must be inspired by the Holy Spirit, for he is the Lord of cell groups. We must then commit all our anxieties and depend on the Holy Spirit. One of the basic secrets of growing and sustaining our church is the message given by the Holy Spirit. I have no problem ministering to my 75,000 church because I have a strong and concrete God-given faith, theology, and pastoral philosophy. Especially, my theology of the fivefold gospel and the threefold blessing has been the secret that has made victory possible for me. Every pastor and cell group leader should prepare an appropriate message. Without this, man and method are of no use. Method The Bible is the basis of our life and our theology. In it we find all of God's methods. The cell system and church growth had their roots in scripture. The early church was made up of family groups, they were born and led by the Holy Spirit, having Jesus Christ as the head of the church. The early church was born at Pentecost, see chapter 2 of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. 120 people were with their hearts united, waiting for the coming of the Lord. Acts 2 verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all with one accord together. Prayer and unity are the two elements that are needed to bear fruit in the kingdom of God. Our prayer must be unified with God's word and guided by the Holy Spirit. The cell system is an informal organization led by the Holy Spirit. This system is not a simple method, tactic, or strategy, but an organization that through the Holy Spirit carries out God's work in all areas in which God's people move. We must apply biblical principles, wisely guided by the Holy Spirit, so that the cellular system grows. How to manage cell groups? The basic work of the cell group is to see to it that all its members reach the stature of the fullness of Christ, through worship services and meetings, and to reach as many souls as possible, so that they can experience the fullness of God's grace. We must set six clear goals, and manage cell groups according to these goals, worship, word, prayer, healing, fellowship, and evangelism. It is important to establish the cellular system and it is necessary that goals and responsibilities are met. The cell group should be a center of attention where the issues of everyday life are discussed. Worship in spirit and in truth. Worship involves the heart of the saints being expressed through praise, thanksgiving, and consecration. Worship is a believer's most important confession of faith, and the place where he or she experiences a personal encounter with God. Worship is a barometer to measure the quality and depth of our faith. Therefore, the depth of worship is the depth of faith. Man is created to worship and praise God. We should fill our daily lives with praise and worship. The number one purpose of cell meetings should be worship. A cell group without worship is like a ship without a rudder. The cell meeting should be a place of worship in spirit and in truth. It is through worship that we examine our hearts, experience God's love, discover his purpose for us, and understand how to best serve others. God is spirit, and he who worships in spirit and in truth must worship him. Proclaim the Holy Word. The saint must always proclaim the message that nourished his spirit, the Word of God, in every meeting. That is, when two or three meet, or when homes are visited. The Word of God is living and effective, and through it the power of the Holy Spirit is manifested. Where there is Word, there is transformation of spirit, soul, body, and circumstance. It is vital to put on the armor of God's Word, otherwise we can fall into the trap of heretical doctrines. In particular, it is essential to teach the new about the meaning of the cross, the church, and the grace of redemption. We should also exhort members who are going through difficult times, teach them how to overcome adversity and live a victorious life for the glory of the Lord. Likewise, the cell group should be a place of fellowship, healing, and abundance in God's word. We must not allow anyone to be guided by dreams, visions, and prophesies without having God's word. Every gift must be under the authority of the word. We have to submit to the Word of God and fix the circumstance in the light of the Word, and say, yes, in case the Word affirms it, or say, no, in case the Word denies it. The Bible, the Word of God, 
is the criterion and barometer for everything. Pray fervently. Prayer is the basic privilege and spiritual encouragement of the believer. God is spirit, and it is through a spiritual act that we can commune with him, namely, prayer. An individual or a church without prayer will not be able to bear fruit. Prayer is the channel through which we can know God and convey our requests to him. Fervent prayer is essential in cell meetings. One of the ministrations of the cell group is to solve the problems of its members and to experience the power and grace of God through a prolonged time of intense prayer. Jesus promised that where two or three would gather together in his name, there he would be in their midst. This means that intense prayer in a cell meeting is powerful. The Holy Spirit manifests his power in our prayer, and in a cell meeting intense prayer is like a spiritual vitamin. Prayer is the speaker through which we hear God's voice and the channel through which we know God's heart. It is through prayer that we can have a personal encounter with God. We must also commune with our neighbor through intercession, for there is no better service than prayer. Heal the sick. Jesus' disciples followed in the Master's footsteps, and whenever they ministered the word, they never forgot to pray for the sick. The Holy Spirit manifested himself through healing. Today it is important to minister healing in our churches and in our cell meetings. Every person suffers from some disease, whether big or small, spiritual or physical. Jesus ministered healing. His twelve disciples and seventy disciples did the same when they proclaimed the gospel. The foundation of heaven is healing, whether you like it or not. Therefore, the power of healing must be manifested in our ministries through prayer. Matthew 10 verses 7 to 8 says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received the gift of grace. God not only gave the leader the mission to proclaim the gospel, but also the gift to heal the sick. Luke 10 verses 17 to 19 says, The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a tao. Behold, I give you power to trample upon serpents and scorpions, and over every power of the enemy, and nothing shall harm you. Likewise, Jesus gave the seventy the power to tread serpents and scorpions when he entrusted them with the work. Luke 10 verses 8 to 9 says, In whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal the sick that are in it, and say to them, The kingdom of God is at hand to you. Here, too, we note that healing is tied to evangelism. And healing is not described as optional, but as an order. In Romans 15 verses 17 to 19, we see how Paul preached the word among the nations with the power of signs and wonders in the power of God's Spirit. Members should never forget to pray for the sick. Of course, it should be remembered that not all the sick will be healed, for in this God's sovereignty is shown. Still, we must stand firm in the word and pray by faith that the sick will be healed according to the attribute of the kingdom of heaven. The cell meeting should be a center of healing. In 1 Peter 2 verse 24 we read, Who himself lifted up our sins and his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, might live to righteousness, and by whose wound you were healed. And Matthew 8 verses 17 and 18 says, that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, when he said, He himself took our infirmities, and bore our infirmities. When Jesus saw himself surrounded by many people, he sent for the passage to the other side. Mark 16 verse 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name they shall cast out demons, they will speak new languages, they shall take serpents in their hands, and if there be anything deadly, it shall not harm them. They will lay their least upon the sick, and they will be healed. In conclusion, healing is God's purpose and command. It is advisable to study these verses by heart and confess them in prayer so that God's healing power may be manifested. It is also necessary to teach these words to the sick person, so that he may pray for his healing and be established in the rock of the word. Remember, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. However, I have a warning to keep in mind when praying for someone who is sick, never lay hands on when there is doubt or insecurity in your heart. Only the prayer of faith can heal the disease, and in case there is doubt or lack of faith, the spirit of sickness can come and take over your body. Offer a communion of love. Communion involves giving words of faith. You should set aside time to commune with the new members and tell them testimonies. Look at the cross. The cross is in the form of the sum, plus, of arithmetic. Likewise, the philosophy of the cross is to add and unite, that is, the vertical stick implies communion with God, and the horizontal stick implies communion with the saints. The cell meeting is the place where bread and love should be given to each other. It is extremely important to form a spiritual atmosphere. 
Immoral and idle words should never be spoken, or words that harm pastors, leaders, and other members. We should not allow worldly conversations within the cell group, but holy words that glorify God. Nor should we allow the buying and selling of goods, loans of interest-bearing money, and signing of guarantee contracts. We must only allow acts of holiness, love, and service. The cell meeting is not a self-interested meeting, but a gathering that glorifies the person of God. Still, there are times when things from the world infiltrate and wreak havoc within the cell group. There is no way we should allow this. The cell meeting should be a worthy meeting that serves God alone. Evangelize with vitality. The cell group is the front line of advancement. Evangelism is our great commission and the best method of multiplying. We must see to it that there is always some new person within the cell group. Unbelievers are often most attracted to the church when they receive God's bread and love in the form of small groups. This is due to geographical conditions, and the unbeliever feels comfortable among his neighbors. We have to make sure that we bring as many unbelievers as possible into our cell groups, and have full fellowship with them, as well as go out to evangelize after the meeting is over. Another task of cell groups is to visit the sick, the poor, and the needy, and to invite them to cell meetings and lead them to the feet of the Lord. Evangelism must not end in simple vocal communication, but must transmit the life of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Power evangelism extends the kingdom of heaven through multiplication. How to monitor cell groups? The leader, to whom ministerial authority is given by the senior pastor, has the responsibility of training and supervising his cell group. He must assume his office as the vocation given by Jesus Christ, and give his best. Supervision is about guarding, caring for, and training the herd. Keep a minute book. The leader should keep a minute book where he has recorded all the data of those who make up the cell group and, in addition, prayer requests, general data of each person, etc. The cell group will remain strong even if there is a change in the pastoral body, since the cell group leader specializes in overseeing his or her group and keeps all records up to date. It is worth remembering the importance of the minute book. For example, writing down the various prayer requests on a piece of paper and handing out copies to everyone in the group is an excellent idea. A caveat here is that the leader should never make known to the rest of the group the transgressions and faults of a particular person. This type of intimacies, which require prayer, is recommended that only the leader take into account and pray for that person. It is important to write a list of prayer requests and distribute it to everyone in the group. That is a demonstration of interest and love for the new members, and especially for those most in need. Supervise according to your gifts. If a gift of the Holy Ghost is manifested in a person, we must help him or her to continue to develop that gift. The cell group leader should monitor each member's level of faith, and turn to the district pastor in difficult cases. The leader should never work alone, but help the group to work according to his or her gifts. But we must be very careful not to allow any kind of mysticism or prophesies without biblical foundations to corrupt the body of the church. The leader should be aware that his or her job is for the health of the cell group, and that the health of the cell group influences the growth of the church. Effective supervision is only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the leader must keep the filling of the Holy Spirit in his life and oversee his group with great fervor, for in this way he will obtain his reward in the kingdom of heaven. Six Principles for Cell Group Monitoring Worship in Spirit and in Truth Proclaim God's Holy Word Pray fervently he ministered healing to the sick. Maintain a communion of love. Evangelize with vitality. Topics to think about. How many people are your church's cell groups made up of? Is there anything that needs modification? Rate your cell group according to the six principles of supervision. The end. End of this first half.